Good morning. Thank you for being on time. I appreciate it. This is a professional seminar. When I go to, when I go to s s speak in Germany, the Germans are extremely punctual. And they'll have a 1,000 people milling around in the lobby. If the seminar is supposed to start at 9 o'clock, 1,000 of those people will be in their seats at 8.59. Not, 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 not 999. They are there in their seats uh, and punctually right on time. You come into seminars in the U.S., people stroll in, stroll out, you know, got their cup, got a cup of coffee, sit in the back, read the newspaper. They sit there straight. I remember I was giving a seminar in Constance, which, like Constance, and, and after I'd spoken for the morning, the, uh, my client came up and thanked me, and he said, thank you very much, and he applauded, and the audience started to applaud, and then they all stood up, and they all started to applaud in unison. Ho, 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 ho. Oh, and I said to my friend, I said, whatever you do, don't give these people guns. <laughs> they are really tough people. Anyway, it's a great experience. We're just sort of setting this up. We have a great day for you. Yesterday, what we did is we sort of cleared the psychological decks. The, 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 the fact is that you have more potential than you could use in 100 lifetimes. Everybody is capable of earning two or three or five times as much as they are. But what holds us back is not a lack of ability or talent. It's simply mental blocks that hold us back from either setting the goals or disciplining ourselves and persevering to achieve the goals. And, and what I'm going to do today is I'm going to show you how to set goals and develop a personal mission and then to unlock the powers of your superconscious mind. Plus we have some other wonderful things that you're going to hear. So today is going to be a really great day. So what we've done is we've cleared the ground and we now have uh, a beautiful piece of property. In, 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 in Rancho Santa Fe, they started settling that back in the 40s and 50s, and it became one of the most expensive postal codes in the United States, if not the most expensive. Minimum lot size was two acres, and they built homes in the old days. And so now we live right near Rancho Santa Fe, so occasionally we go and look at homes there. The homes go up to 25, 30 millions with helipads and so on. But they have in, in, in Rancho Santa Fe a type of home, which is an old home that's been on a beautiful piece of land. And they call it a scraper. And a scraper is where you buy the home for the land, and then you bring in a bulldozer, and you just scrape it off. So you have a com com completely clean piece of land, then you build a new home on the land. So what we did yesterday is we did a scraper exercise. We sort of scraped off all that negative stuff so that we realized that high self-esteem, high self-confidence, Complete optimism are the keys to unlocking all of your powers. Now we've gotten rid of all that clutter. At least we've begun the process of it. It will take time because uh, there's still people you're mad at, pissed off at. Uh, and it will take time, but over time, you'll actually reach the point where you have no negative emotions about anybody. And when you do have negative emotions, you'll know quickly how to cancel them and short circuit them. Knowing that negative emotions are, uh, are the equivalent of physical diseases. They are mental illnesses that hold us back and sabotage our happiness and our future. Pretty soon you get to the point where you're just happy all the time. People think you're smoking real good stuff. <laughs> you're just happy all the time. So now let's talk about, let's talk about goal setting. Um, are you going to change this monitor at the break? So, we, so we've got it on the right monitor? All right, thank you. Uh, the first key to goal setting, we said in 1953, and everybody, everybody disputes this study, it doesn't really matter. Some studies are good, whether or not you can find the foundation stuff. 1953 at Yale University, <clears throat> they did a study of the graduating seniors, and they said, how many people here have goals and have made plans to accomplish them when they graduate? And they found that 84% uh, of them had no goals at all, except to get out of college and to waste their time in the summer. 13% had goals but were not written down. 3% had written goals and plans. So they went back 20 years later, 1953, and they found that the 3% who left the university with written goals and plans were worth more than the other 97% put together. In terms, in financial terms, they were worth more money. And they'd gone to different uh, industries and different companies and different parts of the country, and they started and tried different things, and they'd failed and so on, but they were worth, 90, worth more than the other 97% put together. So in 19, uh, 1979, I'm sorry, 1969, not to be outdone, Yale University or Harvard University did a similar study, found the same things. They found that the average uh, person, 84% of them had no goals. It seems to be consistent. 13% had goals but not written, which means they're just like rattling around like marbles in a big box. And 3% had written goals and plans. And they went back from 79 to 89, I'm sorry, 10 years later, and they found that the people who had 
uh, had goals but had not written them down, were earning an average of twice as much as people who had no goals at all, the 84%. But they found that the people who had written goals and plans were earning on average, the 3% were average, earning 10 times as much as the people without written goals and plans. The fact is that becoming a goal setter, a, 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 so you're right setting and working on goals all the time, increases your likelihood of success by 10 times. And I'll just give you a very simple example. Imagine that you start off across a foreign country, or even a foreign state, but the challenge is that there's no road signs and no road maps. And if you start off toward a distant destination where it happens to be in a foreign country with no road signs and no road maps, how long would it take you to get to where you're going? And the answer is you could probably drive forever. And most people drive forever. But what if you had a clear destination and you had an excellent map and you had perfect road signs so that you could follow and you'd know exactly where you were every step of the way? How long would it take you to get to your destination? Well, you'd probably get there 10 times faster than a person just wandering in circles. Most people's lives just go in circles. They go, they try this and they try that and they try this and they try that and they come home and watch television and they try this and they try that. But successful people just go faster and faster and faster toward what they want to accomplish. And my favorite word in success is the word clarity. Clarity, clarity. You can apply it everywhere. Clarity with regards to your goals, clarity with regards to your plans, clarity with regards to your priorities, clarity in terms of defining your problems or obstacles. But clarity is critical. And here's an interesting discovery. There is a miracle that takes place between the head and the hand. Is when you write something down, psychoneuromotor activity, it actually helps you to understand it with greater clarity. It stimulates creativity, enables you to see it. Many people won't write things down. They say, well, I'm too busy, or I know what I want. Whenever you hear people say, oh, I know, I'm, I know what my goals are, I know what I want. What are, what are your goals? Well, I want to be rich, and I want to be thin, and I want to be happy, and I want to be successful, and I want to travel, and so on. But these are not goals. As I said yesterday, these are fantasies. These are illusions. These are the same things that people in mental asylums have, is they're just fantasies. A goal is, is like a blueprint for a home. It's like a recipe for uh, a, a dish, or it's like a planning of a, a catering party. It's where there's specific plans, details, organized priorities, and they increase the likelihood of achievement by 10 times. Are there any guarantees in life? No. A lot of people had great goals up in 2005, 2006, 2007, even 2008, 2009. We had to do a complete reset. Uh, 2010, 2011, we're doing resets everywhere because the economy has changed. So, what we have to do is we have to go back to the drawing board, set new goals that are more consistent with the times. This doesn't mean we have to abandon them, we just have to adjust to the realities. Just like you, you're planning to go out one day and that night there's a massive cold front comes in, you get out, walk out the door and it's really cold and you're not dressed for it, well, you simply have to adapt to realities. So the fact is the very act of setting goals, writing them down, dramatically increases the likelihood of you achieving them. It has, gives you tremendous clarity and it also activates a whole series of other powers that you don't know about. Now, we've had talked in the past about the laws. They talk about the law of control, the law of accident, law of cause and effect, law of belief, expectation, attraction, subconscious activity, and so on. People say, well, how can I remember all those laws? And what we've done, by the way, is we've written out a definition of those laws for you in the back of your workbook, so you can refer to them. Well, the wonderful thing is when you have goals, you don't need to. When you have goals, what, well, how do you activate the law of control? You have a goal, and a goal gives you control. Is how do you free yourself from the law of accident? With a goal. Is how do you activate the law of cause and effect? The effect the, that you desire is your goal, and all the causes are aimed at achieving that. How do you activate the law of belief? You believe in the ability and your ability to achieve your goal. Law of expectations, you expect that everything will happen will move you towards your goal. Law of attraction, you attract into your life people and resources that help you to achieve your goal. Law of subconscious activity, the subconscious mind works to make your outer world consistent with your inner world of goals. Law of substitution, what do you think about all the time? Instead of negative things, you think about your goals. Law of concentration, concentrate on your goals. You know, law of reversibility, act as if you've already achieved your goals. You start to think about it, you think, oh, law of emotion, what do you put your emotion into? Your goals. And uh, the law of habit, what do you develop? You develop the habit of working on your goals every day. The wonderful thing, like the harmonic convergence that I explained to you yesterday, the wonderful thing is when you have a very clear, specific, burning, focused, well-defined goal, all the laws of the universe line up for you, which is why people with goals accomplish 10 times as much as people without them. Because it's not only their own abilities and resources, it's the abilities and resources of the entire universe 
all come together in harmony to work behind you, to march behind you and drive you forward, motivate you, impel you, inspire you, motivate you, and so on. And it's interesting, you could take a group of 10 people who don't have goals and take photographs of their faces, and then you could take two people out of that lineup, if you like, and have them sit down and write out clear, specific goals as you're going to do in the next few minutes, and then photograph them again, put them back in the lineup. And about 80% of people will be able to pick the people with the goals. That one has a goal, that one has a goal, the other eight don't have goals. They'll be able to pick it because it actually changes your physiology, it changes your, 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 your face, it changes your body language, it changes your eyes, it changes your level of confidence. The very act of writing down and dedicating yourself to the achievement of a specific goal makes you a different human being in a very positive way. Greatest thing of all. So, moving right along here. Five keys to goal setting. Number one, we say the ability to set goals and, uh, and the ability to make plans for their accomplishment is the master skill of success. I've had countless people just over the years where a parent will say, I'm going to send my son, my, who just graduated from university, to this uh, seminar as a gift because I want him to have an overview of life skills. And they, they, look, they always come up to me sometime in the seminar and they say, this is worth more than the four years I just spent in college in terms of how the effect it will have on my life. Remember this, those who do not have goals are doomed forever to work for those who do. It's one choice or another. The ones, who have, the ones who are running everything are the ones with goals. The ones who are working without goals, the 80% who are passive and, and recipient, they're working for people with goals. So we say once you set your goals, your cybernetic mechanism, the goal-seeking part of your brain is triggered. Now this is an important thing to understand. This, the psycho-cybernetics that was discovered about 50 years ago says that your brain automatically moves toward the achievement of a goal. It automatically moves. And, and it, it's very interesting, uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, uh, but it, there is a missile called the Exocet missile. Have you ever heard of the Exocet? It's, the French, it's the French missile, and the French, those bastards, oh, excuse me. Okay. <laughs> what the French did is when, the, uh, when Britain went to war in the Falklands, the French uh, not only sold Exocet missiles to the Argentinians to shoot down uh, or and sink British uh, ships, but shoot down uh, British planes, and then they worked very closely with the Argentines to target the missiles by uh, long distance, by satellite. And the Exocet missile has a very interesting uh, technology, is once it is fixed on a target, the target could go anywhere it wants, and the Exocet missile will follow and adjust and hit the target. So once you're targeted by an Exocet, it's not a good thing. It's not gonna be a good day. The interesting thing is your brain also has a cybernetic mechanism that targets a goal. But here's the interesting thing is when the Sexoset missile is fired, it has to be targeted on a target and then move toward it. When you set a goal and you fire, you start working toward it, you don't have to know where it is. Your cybernetic brain mechanism will actually find the target and keep following the target without you knowing where it is to start with. So people say, I want to double my income or start and build my own successful business or become wealthy, but I have no idea how to do it. No problem, just be clear about the goal and begin. And we say the most important step to success is to launch, take the first step, shoot the missile, and as you start to move toward it, two things happen. You'll start to make course corrections and you'll start to get the goal moving towards you. You'll move toward it, it'll move toward you, almost with unerring accuracy, like two missiles trying to find each other. And you just have to have confidence in that because some of the things that will happen for you will be absolutely remarkable. But this brain mechanism you have is activated by a goal. Once you have put a goal in here, it begins to move automatically 24 hours a day to find the goal. And very often, in the studies that they've done, the 13-year studies at Babson College, they found that people started off thinking that was where their goal was, but it turned out it was somewhere completely otherwise. However, they found they would not have found or achieved their goal if they had not been in motion, if they had not been in flight. Even the finest missile in the world like the Exocet, is of no value until it's fired, until it's in the air and moving. This is the great challenge that people have. It's always ready, 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 aim, 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 never fire. And they wonder why their lives don't get any better. So uh, each of us has both a failure mechanism and a success mechanism built in. Remember I said right at the beginning of the seminar, we are designed for success. We are engineered for accomplishment. And these, this is built into us, however, there's our default setting, our automatic setting, is always failure. It's underachievement, which is why the great majority of the world do, never, do not achieve what is possible for them. 
So uh, the failure mechanism is activated by three factors. And you have to be fighting them, like the little white wolf and the black wolf on the shoulder. Which one you feed is going to determine your whole life. The first that we've talked about is the comfort zone. Now, the comfort zone is we become comfortable doing what we're doing, and we are uncomfortable not doing that. Remember, we, see, we try to move from discomfort toward comfort, but we don't try to move from comfort toward discomfort. And trying a new, something new, setting a new goal, committing ourselves to a whole new course of action or study is a very discomforting thing. And what we do is we pull back into our comfort zone. So the comfort zone is the great enemy of success. It keeps us in a homeostatic situation. It keeps us constant with our previous behaviors. It keeps us at a low level of accomplishment. In order to break out of the comfort zone, we've got to set bigger goals. We've got to set big goals, big, hairy, audacious goals that really wake us up that are impossible to accomplish at our current level of accomplishment. Now, the second is, the, is learned helplessness. And they've done 25 years of research at the University of Chicago on behavior. And what they find is the greatest single obstacle to success in their studies is people feel helpless. They can't make a change. They feel they don't have the money, and they don't have the time, and they don't have the skills, and they don't have the friends, and, and they're broke, and they've lost their money, and they just feel helpless. And helplessness leads to a feeling of hopelessness and a feeling of passivity. But the fact of the matter is there has never been a better time than today in the history of the Western world for you to achieve great goals. Do we have lots of problems out there? Great. And we've always had problems. We have them a little bit more exaggerated today, but we've always had problems. And within every problem, usually there's an opportunity for a creative person to find a way to solve it and to make money at it, to make a contribution. So learned helplessness is the fact is that you are not helpless. And so that's why you say to yourself over and over again, I can do it. I can do anything I put my mind to. I can do anything I put my mind to. When Bella Caroli was training Mary Lou Retton, he would always say to her, Mary Lou, you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. And they, they were so jealous of him in the Olympics, they would not give him a floor pass. They would not allow him on the floor with Mary Lou when she was competing, the most important Olympics of her life. They forced him to stay in the stands with the um, uh, spectators. And so Mary Lou would come off the, um, the, 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 uh, the come off the, the, the comp 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 area of competition, and she'd have to run up and run up the stairs and talk to her coach over the barriers. And he would say to her, he'd give her advice on the next run, the next jump, the next so on, give her advice, and the last thing he would always say is, Mary Lou, you can do it. You can do it. And that just motivated her. 10, 10, 10, 10 gold medals. Made her the greatest Olympian in, in the world of her time. But it was always Bella saying, you can do it. And for yourself, always say to yourself, I can do it. I can do it. If I have a goal, the fact is, the fact that you can conceive of a goal means that you probably have within you or around you the ability to achieve it. There is a factor that in life, you cannot conceive of a great goal without simultaneously having the ability to achieve that goal. Uh, and so the very fact that you could think of it means that it's probably possible for you. We said yesterday you become what you teach. So when, from now on, whenever any, anybody around you has a goal or a dream or a hope, what do you tell them? The Bella Caroli advice. You can do it. You can do it. Sometimes one piece of encouragement from one person at a time when a person is not sure and you say you can do it will change that person's life. And from then on, they'll say, I can do it. And they'll become self-motivated. So learned helplessness, we get over learned helplessness by taking action. And the third is the path of least resistance. And I've written extensively on this, but the path of least resistance is a really big killer. What it is, is the tendency to look for the easy way, the fast way, the cheap way, the, the, the method of least effort or least cost to achieve things. And what we have in our society today, which is as a result of several generations of affluence, is we have an enormous number of people who are literally addicted to the shortcut, the easy way, the fast, quick way. Um, there's, there's an old saying with regard to these get-rich-quick schemes. When a man uh, with experience meets a man with money, the man with money is going to end up with the experience, and the man with the experience will end up with the money. So you'll find that the newspapers and magazines and television are all full of get-rich-quick schemes. Because there's always people who think it's possible to get rich quick. 
get rich easy. All you have to do is find a trick or a gimmick. And there's an enormous number of people who say rich people are just people who were lucky. You know, they just had a gimmick. They just, it was a trick. The fact is that the rich have been studied at great length. It takes about 22 years from the time you decide to become a millionaire before you hit a million dollars net worth X your house. It takes about 22 years on average based on the studies of many thousands and tens of thousands of self-made millionaires. People say, wow, that's a long time. If it is, get on with it. So people start at 20, by the age of 42, they're millionaires. By the age of 45, uh, they're dual millionaires. By the age of 50 or 55, because as we say, the first million is hard, the second million is inevitable. And so what you do is you have to make the first million. Why? It's because you have to become a very different, disciplined, higher form of human being to actually make such a contribution that you actually earn and hold on to more than a million dollars. It forces you to become somebody really different than you've ever been before. So the idea that you can short circuit this, you can just jump to the head of the line with no work, is an idea that people fall for all the time. Just poor suckers. And what happens is it never works. It's not possible. It'd be the same if somebody says, I weigh 300 pounds, I want to find a 30-day method to be fit and Olympic, uh, have Olympic abs and be perfectly fit and have my ideal weight. You'd say, well, that's impossible. That's preposterous. If you want to, lose, if you want to get to be your ideal weight, you may, must put in at least a year or two years, and then you have to keep it for your whole life. Well, it's the same thing. Anything worthwhile accomplishing takes a long, long time of hard, hard work. So if that's the case, then get on with it. <laughs> you might as well get started because the time is going to pass anyway. You might as well get started. So uh, those are the three enemies, and they're always there like that black wolf. Come on, take the easy way. Come on, it's okay. You can't do that. Now, you're not smart enough. Or, uh, hey, aren't you comfortable now? So always trying to talk you into taking it easy. The only way to override the failure mechanism is to activate your success mechanism, and your success mechanism is activated, triggered by a goal. Once you set a goal, you become a different person. It's almost like throwing a switch, and wow, your whole life begins to change. So there are uh, the, seven, the four major reasons that people don't set goals. Number one reason is they don't realize the importance of goals. People always say, oh, I have goals. This is, this is a real mistake. If the person says, I have goals already, well, then they won't set any. But, it, but goals are clear, written plans, blueprints with organized uh, lists of activities organized by priority and sequence and prioritized that you work on every day. That's a goal. A goal isn't, isn't a wish or a fantasy. A goal is something specific, like imagine building a building and you hire a contractor. The contractor arranges to have an architect design the building. Then they pick the land. Then they lay out the land. Then they lay down every part of the foundation. And the, each part of the building is built step by step according to the blueprint. That's how you build a life. You build a great life by thinking through. Uh, I have to tell you a quick story. There was a, a fellow who was visiting a friend of his around Christmas time, about December 15th, and it was, they just had a party there the night before. And um, he was going around the uh, house, and he was taking all the tailings in the glasses and the bottles, pouring them into one uh, whiskey bottle. And he had a little bit of beer, a little bit of wine, a little bit of vodka, a little bit of whiskey, some Coke and everything, pouring it into this bottle. And his friend says, um, Bill, he said, what are you doing? He said, well, he said, I'm collecting up all the tailings from the drinks from all the people here last night. He said, well, what are you doing that for? He said, well, he said, at Christmas time, people are always dropping in, around Christmas, dropping in without warning, and they show up and knock on the door and say, I just thought we'd just drop in and see you. And so come on, and I say, well, um, we, we have to be polite, say, would you like a drink? And they say, yeah, well, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, what would you like? Well, anything. Well, this year, they're going to get anything. That's what people do in life, is they, they basically get anything. If they don't have goals, they just get the tailings. They get whatever is left over. Um, so they don't realize the importance of written goals. And I've worked with people for years who finally wrote down goals, and they said it was like pushing down a dynamite detonator. Their whole life exploded. They could not believe the pre and post. Just like the gentleman I told you about yesterday who accomplished 101 goals and transformed his life, I could sit here and tell you stories like that until the sun went down. There are so many of them that people are just staggered by the impact of the exercise you're going to go through. So number two, they don't know how. Uh, you could take an entire master's degree. I eventually got an MBA, uh, which is equivalent of you know, 15 years of university, for 15 years of schooling, 12 in high school and five in, in college. And not once did you get one hour of instruction on goal setting. Not once. And so people who come out of colleges and universities have no idea how to set a goal. They'll have all this book learning, as they say, 
but no goal setting learning. Uh, number three is fear of criticism. It's people are afraid that others will criticize them if they set a goal. I want to change my life, start a business. I want to uh, pay off all my debts, move to a, a nice place, uh, achieve financial independence. People say, ah, you can't do that. You're too young. You're too old. You're not well enough educated. The economy sucks. Wah, wah, wah. And so they're afraid of criticizing, so they don't set goals at all. Because remember, many people are very sensitive about the criticism of others. So here's the secret. Keep your goals confidential. Don't tell other people about your goals. Sometimes I found that telling other people about your goals queers the goals. It kind of, it kind of trips you up. And so what you do is the only people you tell, like our staff in our company, we have goals, and everybody knows what our goals are. And at home, Barbara and I have goals, and Barbara and I know what our goals are. So only share your goals with people who are in complete harmony with you and your goals, who are really committed to them as well and, and want you to be successful. Uh, other than that, keep them confidential. The key is demonstrate your goals by achieving them. And in retrospect, and have people say, geez, how did you accomplish that? Well, now you can tell them, is I had a very clear plan, and I worked on it every day until I achieved it. Uh, number uh, four is fear of failure. And this is the biggest killer of all. The fear of failure is the fear that if I set a goal, I won't achieve it. What if I lose my time? What if I lose my money? What if I invest all this time and, and then and nothing happens? Or what if I invest my money and, and I don't achieve it? Or, or, or what if I put my whole heart into it and it doesn't work out? And the fear of failure is so traumatic for most people that they won't even take the first step. And so the way that you overcome the first fear, fear of failure is basically you just simply say, I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. If I can set a goal, I can achieve it. And here's an interesting point. Almost everybody fails the first few attempts of goal setting. They did a uh, study on one of the, they had four self-made millionaires under the age of 30 on one of the New York television shows. And the interviewer said, just right at the break, how many different businesses have you guys been in before you made a million dollars, before you hit the million dollar jackpot? And so they went to break and the guy sat down and calculated. They came back afterwards and they'd worked out that they had started an average, started and failed in an average of 17 businesses before they hit number 18 where they made a million dollars. Now the great question is this, did they fail 17 times? No, every single business they started and failed in or underachieved in taught them valuable lessons that eventually accumulated, accumulated into their success in the 18th business. And they could all look back and say, all my success today is because of all my mistakes in the past. So what we do is we just go into it wholeheartedly, like in Texas Hold'em, we just go all in, and then if it doesn't work, we learn, and then we do it again. We don't just give up. We don't say, oh, well, I tried it once. I've met people who've tried to start a business with no business experience, and they failed, and for the rest of their life, they just cursed and were angry and worked for wages and, and sulked and hated other people in business and so on because they tried it once and it didn't work out. Instead of just trying it again and again. So don't be afraid of failing because I can promise you this, you're going to fail. You're going to fail over and over again. Successful people are great failures. They fail all the time. They don't like it, but they fail vastly more times than failures fail. But they don't look upon it as a failure. Successful people never use the word failure. It does not appear in their vocabularies. They did a Harvard study on this. They find that top people in every industry never use the word failure. They call it learning experience, expensive learning experience, painful learning experience, but it's never a failure. It's merely an opportunity. As Henry Ford said, Failure is merely an opportunity to more intelligently begin again. Merely an opportunity to more intelligently begin again. So if instead of thinking how much you lost and, and how disappointed you were, think of what lessons you learned. Think of the valuable lessons. Write them all down. Write them down. I learned this. Next time I'll do this and this and this. And just keep thinking of all the lessons. As you think about the lessons, because of the law of substitution, you actually become more positive and happy and excited. And you think, what a great experience this was. And you write down the lessons, and you cannot be negative when you're thinking about all the things you've learned. Okay? And it's those lessons that you learn that get you to the point where you are the kind of person who can earn and keep the kind of money that you want. Uh, so the five keys to for goal setting. Number one is fear of change is a major source of fear and stress today. Uh, we're traumatized by it, but goals allow you to control the direction of change. You see, if I said there's going to be some big changes in your life, your income is going to go up by $100,000 a year. Who's going to say, oh, I don't want that kind of a change in my life? We're not afraid of positive changes. We're concerned about negative changes. How do you avoid negative and unpredictable changes? You put your hands on the steering wheel of your own car, and you control 
your own destiny. And you do that with written goals. Nobody's afraid of change as long as it's under your control. It's, it's uncontrolled change. It's, control, it's change that comes from the outside that causes us the stress and tension of being out of control. So we say the, your, the area of excellence is a fifth, second key to goal setting. What this says is that each person has the ability to be excellent in one or more areas. I've learned this and relearned it and relearned it, but I cannot tell you how important it is. It is one of your greatest responsibilities to yourself in life is to determine your area of excellence and put your whole heart into becoming excellent in that area. Whether it takes months or weeks or years, in most cases it will take two, three, four, five, six, seven years for you to get into the top 10% of your field. But whatever your area of excellence is, and I'll show you how you can determine it in a second, whatever your area of excellence is, you must commit to excellence. You must commit to becoming excellent because in the absence of a commitment to excellence, you merely default to mediocrity. The great tragedy in our world today, the bottom 80%, they're not good at anything. They get up in the morning and they look in the mirror and the person who looks back is not particularly good at anything. They're very easily replaced at their work. There's lots of people who can do the job just as well as them. They have permanent insecurity. And they're only paid the amount necessary to stop them from quitting. And that's only when times are good. So they never get ahead financially. Their income goes up, the bottom 80%, according to Gary Becker, Nobel Prize winning economist at the University of Chicago, average person's income goes up about 1% above inflation if they're working, the bottom 80%. Top 20%, their average income goes up at about 11% per annum. At 11% per annum, your income will double every five or six years. At 1% per annum, your income will double in terms of buying power in 72 years. So people at the bottom 80% are always in debt and they never get free because they're not good at anything. And it's the most amazing thing. I, I'll tell you, I had, uh, Barbara and I went to a um, uh, hotel, Ritz Carlton, in Naples, Florida. It's got the one of the highest ratings in, of hotels in the United States. We go in there and there's this, this nice guy, black guy, he's the uh, bellman. And he comes up and he helps us out with the bags. And he said, Mr. and Mrs. Tracy, welcome. It's so good to have you here. I'm thinking, how did he know who I was? What he did is he quickly looked at the bag tags while he was taking them out and saw that well, there, was a, there was a male and female, Barbara's tags, my tags. He had them, before he had them out, he knew the names. And we said, well, gee, thank you. He said, you're welcome. It's wonderful to have you here. We really appreciate it. Uh, you help you have a great time. He took the bags in. We go in, in, you go in and around, and there's the check-in counter. Mr. and Mrs. Tracy, geez, it's good to have you here. How the hell did they know it was us? He had telephoned. As the bags were going in, he had telephoned and told them the Tracys are coming up to the desk. By the time we got upstairs, the maid's waiting there. Mr. and Mrs. Tracy, let me show you to your room. I mean, you, you couldn't believe it. Then when you check out, he remembers your name because he's got a game with names. He remembers names. He remembers your name when you're checking out or going out or everything else. This guy gets $20 tips, and he sure did from us. He gets $20 tips all day long. Do you know if people are checking in all day long, two or 300 people, $20 a time, can you do the numbers here? This guy is, makes about $120,000 a year unloading bags from the back of a truck. Is he one of the best in the business? You bet your bippy. Do other hotels want him and offer him money and higher, higher base salary and so on and so forth? Because he's so good at being a bellhop. Uh, and, and so you can be good in all kinds of things. I could tell you story after story. You don't have to be brilliant. You, know, uh, you don't have to be uh, uh, a genius or highly educated. Whatever you're doing, you can be really good at it. And I've seen, have you seen waiters who are really good at waiting? And have you seen people in gas stations really good at being in gas stations? And those are places you go back to over and over again. Hairdressers who are really good at hairdressing. In other words, every person has the ability to be excellent at something. And you must decide what it is and you have to become excellent. Without a commitment to excellence, you default to mediocrity. And mediocrity leads to low self-esteem and financial insecurity all your life. Now, here's the other point, is that when you feel yourself becoming excellent, when you commit to becoming excellent, your self-esteem goes up. As you get better, there's a rule that says that happiness is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. It's the step-by-step -step moving towards something that's important to you. So when you become the top in your field or one of the best in your field, you will feel fabulous. However, every step you take toward becoming excellent makes you feel fabulous as well. It's like a constant input of, 
high self-esteem, self-confidence, you just feel better and better about yourself by the very act of feeling yourself moving towards becoming better. Every single thing you learn and do to improve your performance makes you feel happier. So therefore, it's very important. Okay, so we say there are three keys to finding your area of excellence. And by the way, this will change over time. You will find that in one field, uh, you'll need to be excellent in a particular skill area in order to uh, succeed in that field. So you'll have to get to work and develop that skill. Uh, first of all, attention. Uh, attention is something that holds your attention, that grasps your attention. Uh, philosophers will tell you that life is the study of attention. Where your attention goes, your heart is. Wherever your heart is, your attention goes automatically, almost like the heat-seeking missile will move toward what they pay attention to. So attention is a really interesting uh, way of understanding who you are and why you're put on this earth. What do you pay attention to? What do you like to read about? What do you like to talk about? What do you like to think about? What ca captures your attention when somebody else is doing it or talking about it? Many years ago, I fell in love with economics, especially free market economics. My, my mind goes, my, my, my attention goes unerringly to articles, books, courses, people on television who are talking about the economic situation. I just love the subject of economics. Of course, I love the subject of success as well and achievement and so on. But my mind just goes unerringly to those facts and figures and statistics. So the second area is interest. What are you interested in? What have you always been interested in? Quick story, I had a man in my seminar, he came up to me, he was about 35 years old. He said when he was young, and the third is absorption. When he was young, he said he, was, he loved airplanes. And all he wanted was airplanes. He was fascinated with airplanes. He got his kid, father to take him out to air shows. He got airline, airplane posters and put them in his room. He got airline books that he got for Christmas. He made model airplanes. He just loved airplanes. And when he went to school, he had various courses of study, he decided to study aeronautical engineering. And he just loved it. He graduated at the top of his class. He loved it. And then went out and started a business. The first business he started was working in aircraft design. Actually, he worked for another company in aircraft design, engineering, and so on. And he finally started his own company. And then he started a leasing company for aircraft. And then he started a repair company for aircraft. And now he had three companies thriving. He was a multimillionaire. He was the happiest damn guy you could ever imagine. He said he, all he ever did was what he loved to do, what just absorbed him from the time he was a child. Now, there is a whole series of studies that have been done that say whatever absorbed your attention between the ages of 7 and 12 is a very good indication of what you should be doing as an adult. So if you can go back and say, what was I doing between the ages of 7 and 12? What did I love to do? I just could not keep away from it. I, I had to be dragged away from it to eat dinner with my family. I went back to it all the time. What did you love to do between 7 and 12? And many people will say, I can't even remember, so they'll call their mother or their father, especially the mother. Fathers are hopeless in this area. Um, but mothers will remember, oh, between the ages of 7 and 12, you just loved to do this. You loved to write poetry. You just loved to write poetry all the time. And you're thinking, isn't that interesting? Because I love to read poetry. I like to read about poets. I, I, I love to buy poetry books and everything else. It could mean that you have within you the ability to be an outstanding poet. Because remember, if you attention, interest, and absorption is on a subject, it means probably within you is the ability to excel in that area. And sometimes people say, well, area of excellence. Oh, but look at all the hard work. No, if it's right for you, it's not hard work. You love it. You love to get better in an area that's right for you. You cannot imagine yourself not getting better all your life. You just love the process of learning and getting better. So. Five keys, the acres of diamonds theory. The acres of diamonds principle, one of the most important principles ever discovered, it came from a man named Russell Conwell. Russell Conwell, back in the early part of the last century, was asked if he would help to raise funds for a university for worthy young men and women who could not afford to attend a university. And he was a minister, so he decided to design a talk that he could give to groups and charge for and give the money to the fundraising for the college. So he designed a talk called Acres of Diamonds, one of the most famous talks in history. And Acres of Diamonds began with the story of an African farmer who uh, heard about uh, people who had gone off into Africa and earned uh, fabulous fortunes. Um, actually, let me go back and tell you the whole story. It takes just about three minutes. 
He's running his farm. His farm is quite prosperous. It's doing well. It's on the main caravan or trade routes. And one day, one of the traders who were traveling through this caravan stopped at the house for the night, which they often did, and uh, told him stories about people who had gone off into Africa and made fortunes by finding diamond mines. And it got him so excited about that, he decided he would sell his farm and go off into Africa and find a diamond mine and become fabulously wealthy. So he did. And he got a caravan and he set off into Africa. And for another next 10, 12, 13 years, he searched for diamonds and never found any. And finally, he was out of money and everybody abandoned him and he threw himself in the ocean and drowned. Well, meanwhile, the trader who kept working back and forth between the great trading capitals um, one day stopped at this house again and um, was talking to the farmer. And he asked the farmer, what is that rock on your mantelpiece there? He said, well, that's a rock I found out on the farm uh, in the creek bed. And it throws, throws off light in a strange way, so I just brought it in. He said, that's, that's not a rock. He said, that's a diamond. I'm a diamond merchant. I know what diamonds are. He said, that's a diamond in its rough form. He said, where did you find it? He said, well, I found it out on the farm where I was watering one of my mules. So he said, well, show me where. So they went back out, and they looked around in this creek bed, and they found another, and they found another, and they found another. They found that the farm was literally covered with acres of diamonds. The old farmer had gone off looking for diamonds without realizing that diamonds do not look like diamonds in their rough form. Diamonds come disguised as rough pieces of rock that have to be cut and polished. As Henry Kaiser once said that most people miss opportunities because they come disguised as hard work. And he said a diamond comes disguised as hard work. He said, but your great diamonds may lie right under your own feet. The, the, what you are seeking for more than anything else may lie under your own feet. This, by the way, is this proverbial tale of the discovery of King Solomon's mines, the greatest diamond discovery in the history of the world up until the De Beers discovery in South Africa. So five years, so here's, here's what we find out. Your greatest opportunities might, might lie under your own feet, but they don't look like opportunities, they look like hard work. So your business, your knowledge, your talents, your experiences, your company, your friends, what have you been good at in the past? What are you good at now? What do you like doing? What are the great needs and problems around you? Sometimes people have seen, just seen one problem that nobody is solving and developed a solution for it. People got tired of carrying around Walkmans, yet people wanted to be able to carry their music around with them. And technology kept advancing and advancing and advancing. And here's this computer company that's down to 3% of the market and basically a sidebar in the computer world, whereas Microsoft has 90%. And so Steve Jobs comes up with iTunes. And he first of all came up with the iPod and said, but to have music for the iPod, you've got to have iTunes. So he negotiated with all the great record companies to sell tunes at 99 cents instead of buying a whole CD, which has one good song and 15 killer, 15 duds. And then he made it possible that you go on and load it up. And he created the iPod revolution, sold 50 million copies. And then came out with the iPhone, which just revolutionized telephones, and then the iPad. Now Apple is the second highest valued company in the world. I had friends who bought Apple 10 years ago, and after the whole world went to hell in a handbasket financially, these people can now retire rich because they bought Apple when it was $25 a share, and now it's 600 um, or whatever it happens to be. Because he said, here is an opportunity. Here is a problem. Here's something that people want and need. And now the technology exists for it. So the, the, you, all around you, there may be opportunities that you can use. So like diamonds, opportunities come disguised as hard work. Don't expect to find something and become rich. Pick up a diamond and run to the bank and make a lot of money. What you'll do is you have an opportunity to work your behind off for three, five, six, seven years. And in so doing, you'll become wealthy and you'll achieve all your goals. All the great successes have spent many, many years getting to that point. And then they say, gee, this person was, sure was lucky. Sure was lucky. No, I wasn't lucky. You could not imagine the years and the travail. The average entrepreneur, entrepreneurial millionaire works 60 hours a week. 60 hours a week. 59, actually, if you look at the numbers. Some work 70 and 80. Nobody is successful working 40 hours a week. 40 hours a week is absolute prediction of failure. You will absolutely guaranteed fail if you work 40 hours a week. You know, no matter how smart you are, really successful people work 50, 60 hours. So um, five keys to goal setting. Your goals must be in balance with each other and with your needs. You can't have, I spoke to one guy, he wanted to be, start his own business and become successful, but he wanted to play golf every day for three hours. He had two, two goals, one which killed the other. 
If you play golf, you can't build a successful business. If you build a successful business, you can't play golf. Uh, you have personal and family goals. These are, you need about three to five. Remember you, we said you could have 10 to 15. Uh, these are the reasons why goals. And never forget, as Nietzsche said, if a person has a big enough why, they can endure almost any what. And so your why is the real reason why you have goals. Many of us become so, and men are the big, big sinners here, have uh, goals that we want to be successful at work for our families. But if you ask the families, the families say, we just wish that he was at home more often. And so balance with regard to that. Never forget the major reason that you want to achieve your goals is so that you can fulfill yourself and the dreams of your family. Really important. The second is business and career goals. Now, you need about three to five business and career goals, too. And these are income goals, growth goals, and so on. And these are the, reason, these are, these are the what goals. And what is what you have to do to achieve your personal goals. And finally, there are the self-improvement goals, learning, growth, development goals. And these are the how goals, is how do you achieve the what to achieve the why. And how is you just get really good at what you're doing. You get better and better at key skills. Sometimes I use the example, when I decided to write a book the first time, I was a hunt and peck typer, uh, you know, uh, hunt and peck, you type like this. If you are really good at hunt and peck, you can type five to eight words a minute. And I realized that in order to write a book, I would have to learn to touch type. And I never learned to touch type. I've been doing hunt and peck for years. So I bought a little program, cost 1995, on CD called Mavis Beacon Teaches Typing. Any, anybody here know Mavis? Ain't she great? Ain't she great? We love Mavis, I'll tell you. And this Mavis Beacon teaches typing, you push it in, and it immediately has you do a little type test, put in your name, do a little typing test, it shows you that your speed is five to eight words a minute. And then every single time you go on, it gives you a lesson that is stage appropriate. And it gives you, it shows you where to put your hands, which fingers to use. Within 90 days, Mavis, Mavis can get you up to touch typing uh, 60 to 80 words a minute. Now, if you can touch, let's say, say 50 to 80, if you can touch five to eight words a minute with touch type, and 90 days later you're touching 50 to 80, what is that a magnitude of in terms of improvement? 10 times. And what you've done is you haven't learned anything remarkable. You're not flying jets or doing astrophysics. What you've done is you've learned a critical skill that jillions of people have, and by, with that skill, you can now access the entire world of information on the internet. You can communicate with everybody. You can write books, articles. You can, you can do phenomenal things with 50 to 80 words a minute with one additional skill. Many cases, sometimes you are just one skill away from doubling, tripling, quadrupling your performance and your output. Sometimes you're one skill away. If you're in sales, by the way, what is the critical skill in sales? It's the kickoff in sales. It's prospecting. Well, most salespeople don't like prospecting because of the fear of rejection. And yet, their very top salespeople love prospecting and they love rejection because they recognize the more rejection they get, the more sales they're going to make. And so, bring it on, baby. You know, bring it. The more people say no, the more likely they'll get to people who will say yes. You just get through the no's. So, if people say no, 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 no. They say fine, 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 bang until they get to yes. And so, they love no's. And you know something? If you do one switch, you take one plug in your metal switchboard out, I hate no, and I love yes, and you switch it around and you say, I love no, and I don't care, and I know yes is inevitable. When you start to love no, your sales will double. Your income will double when you start to love no. And then you'll start to have more successes, which will cause your self-esteem and self-confidence to go up, which will cause you to be even more aggressive about getting no's, and you just don't even care anymore. And sometimes when people say no, you laugh, because that, that's a guarantee, just one step closer to a sale. And what I'm talking about here, I teach my sales audiences, if you had no fear of rejection at all, what are the sort of things that you'd want to do in your business career? If you were guaranteed that every person you spoke to would buy from you, you'd be speaking to people from dawn to dusk. You'd be running up and grabbing people on the sidewalk. I mean, you'd be cold calling office buildings. You'd be phoning everybody in the yellow pages. If you were guaranteed of a yes, well, the fact is that you are guaranteed of an enormous number of yeses if you're willing to endure the no's. And so you just say, I love to hear the word no. Because every time I hear the word no, that's money in my bank account. Because it's putting me one step closer to yes. And if you just change your mentality like that. So if you became really excellent at prospecting by one change in your thinking, what would that do to your income? If you became a prospecting machine, if you became a danger to yourself and others, you became the kind of person that people see you coming, they flee. Because they know if they talk to you, they're going to end up exchanging money. Uh, and it's only going to go one way. Um, 
Okay, so self-improvement goals. What are the skills, the essential skills you need to learn to be able to use all of your other talents? The next key is you need, a, the next of the five keys, you need a major definite purpose. Your major definite purpose is the one goal which if you achieved it would have the greatest positive impact on your life. Napoleon Hill changed the lives of many people with some of his observations based on 22 years of research into wealthy people. People who started with nothing and became some of the wealthiest people in America. And the first thing he's talking about, he says your life only becomes great when you can select the major definite purpose and then put all of your energies and all your emotions behind that major goal. And when I learned that, as young people did, I learned it when I was 23, changed my life forever. Everybody who ever learns the principle of the one major goal, what we, used to call, what we call the focal point. We teach our focal point process in our coaching. We teach people to pick a focal point or a critical goal in, in each particular area. And once you're clear about that, then all the harmonic convergence lines up, all the planets line up, all the laws begin to work in your favor behind that major goal. But people say, well, can I have a whole bunch of major definite purposes? Well, can, you, can you ride a whole bunch of bicycles? No, you can only ride one bicycle at a time, one horse at a time. Now, you can have minor goals, and you can have them organized in priority and so on, but you must always have one. I call it the ball carrier goal. This is the ball carrier goal. The ball carrier determines how far the team moves ahead, it determines the line of scrimmage, it determines how fast the team moves toward the goal line. Your ball carrier is your biggest goal. Now, the interesting thing about working on your one goal is what do you think happens to all your other goals when you're totally fascinated, passionate about one goal. What happens to all your other goals? You start to achieve them as well. Just as the ball carrier moves ahead, the whole team comes up to the same line of scrimmage. All your other goals move ahead as the ball carrier moves ahead. And so therefore, selecting that one goal is one of the great responsibilities of adult life. Selecting your area of excellence is a great responsibility that you cannot delegate and you cannot avoid. You can take tests and you can ask other people and you can get advice, but you've got to know what it is. And your major definite purpose is that one goal, and you've got to decide what that is. Will it change over time? Yes. Can it change? Of course. Different circumstances will cause you to change it. But in order for you to realize your full potential at the highest level, you've always got to have a major goal that is essential and a major skill area that you're working to become excellent in. So it must be a smart goal. It must be specific. It must be measurable. In other words, uh, it cannot be a vague goal. A child should be able to understand your goal. You should be able to write it on the back of a business card. It should be as clear as a bell. It's got to be measurable so that a person can tell whether or not it's been accomplished. It can't be, I want to, I want to make lots of money. It's not a goal. It's a fantasy. Is I want to earn a specific amount of money this year, and sometimes next year I want to earn a specific amount of money. I want to achieve a specific net worth. In other words, it's got to be clear so a child can tell you, yes, you've made it, or no, you haven't. Uh, it has to be achievable. You cannot set preposterous goals. I have people who come up to me after a discussion like this and say, well, I've decided to be a billionaire in one year. I still remember this one woman came up to me in a seminar, very, very arrogant. I've decided to be a billionaire in one year. And I said, well, that's pretty big goal. She said, well, you said you can have any goal you want. I said, yes, but it has to be realistic. And, well, what do you mean? It has to be an achievable goal. I said, well, what, what, what are you working at right now? She said, well, I just got fired for uh, incompetence. <laughs> I said, how much money are you worth? She said, well, I'm broke. I had to borrow money to come to this seminar. I said, and you expect to go from zero, broke, incompetent, to a billion dollars in a year? I said, how about going to $1,000 in one year? Become a thousand heir, and then a 2,000 heir, and then a 10,000 heir, because as, you, as the Bible says, O good and faithful servant, you have been faithful over small things, I will make you master over large things. You can't go from broke to buckets of money. You have to demonstrate that you can be master over small amounts of money, that you can take the money and that you can hold on to it and that you can save it and that you can invest it and that you can deploy it. If you do that with small amounts of money, you'll get bigger amounts. By a law of attraction, you'll attract more money that you'll be able to carefully invest and deploy and put away. And as you do that, you'll attract more money and you'll earn more money. In other words, you have to walk before you run. And so people who want to go from zero to making lots of money are living in cloud cuckoo land. They actually need sedation and maybe even, you know, maybe even serious institutional help because they're living in a fantasy land. It's not possible to do it. To become excellent in your area takes seven years. 
takes 10,000 hours from the time you start to the time you excel, getting to the top 10%, takes seven years and or 10,000 hours of dedicated, hard, relentless work on yourself and your craft. That has been proven for 50 years. And every single time you see a successful person, you say, when did you start in this? 10, 15, 20 years ago? Work 60 hours a week for years and years that nobody ever saw or appreciated. And then finally they broke through and people say, boy, you're sure lucky. Sure are lucky. They were watching, the ones who say that were home watching television seven days a week while well, this person was working their head off. So it's really important. And it must be uh, realistic. Make it a goal. If you set a goal that's too big, what happens is your subconscious mind actually short circuits and stops. It just kicks it out like a rejection. When I first learned about self-concept and goal setting, and you earn as much on the outside as your self-concept on the inside, I immediately set a goal to double my income within one year. And what happened is nothing. Nothing happened. I didn't start moving forward at all, and then I realized, oh my God, I've sabotaged myself by setting a goal that's preposterous. I was now 33, 34, 35 years old, 35 years old, and I'm earning this kind of income. How can I double it in one year? It's taken me 35 years to get to this point, working pretty hard. How could I double it in one year? So I cut it back to increase it by 50% in a year, and then everything started to move. 50% is a believable goal. 50% is 3 or 4% a month. You can do that. That's an achievable goal. Manage your time better, work harder, start earlier, stay later, and then as you start to move toward 50%, raise the bar again, 75%. As you hit your 50%, raise it again, 50% next year, which is now even a larger sum of money. Are you with me so far? And so eventually, within 10 years, I increased my income 10 times. But I had to start off earlier. Do you know that if you increase your income 26% per year, you'll increase it 10 times in 10 years? If you increase it 2% a month, 26% a year, there's 13 four-week months in a year. 52 weeks, 13 times four. You got me there? In there? If you do it every four weeks, you increase your income 2%, half a percent a week, one-tenth of a percent per day. One one-thousandth per day, you'll increase your income 10 times in 10 years. Does it work? Everybody who I've ever, it's a formula. Everybody I've ever taught the formula to has, has increased their income three, four, five, ten times, and faster than 10 years. But it's incremental. It's a little tiny bit every single day. Every single day you get a little tiny bit better in what you're doing. So, and finally it has to be time bounded. All goals have to have an exclamation point at the end. They have to have a time. This is a time when you want to achieve the goal. And why? It's because your subconscious mind needs a time to focus on. Just like the restaurateur needs a time when you want to come for dinner. You've got to give me a time so I can arrange the table. Your subconscious mind will drive you forward toward the goal and attract the goal toward you as long as you have a deadline. If you just say, I want to be rich someday, I want to make a million someday, I want to be thin someday, then you'll get it someday. You'll get anything. Like in the bottle, that's what you'll get. You'll achieve your goal like any time, like maybe next lifetime. 